There are uh, sports that accentuate individual strength and ability. This weekend, uh, our middle Fraser grandson went to, uh, I think, Grand Island for a Pee Wee wrestling tournament and pinned a couple guys, won second place. That's one, that's one of those sports that's very individual. You know, there may be a team score, but it's, it's still related to just individual strength. Swimming, many of the, of the, of the uh, track and field events, uh, again, are, are based upon individual strength. But on the other hand, there are numerous sports which are, are based upon group strength. And we can think of uh, basketball. You can't have a one-man basketball team. Uh, we think about uh, baseball, softball. We think about our beloved Nebraska football and some think of other football, but anyhow, those are all team sports. And, and, and those things are, are dependent upon how each person participates within the makeup of the whole. Individual strength is important, but how one uses that individual strength within the boundaries of the team is really of greater significance. Although it's not fair to compare Christian, our Christian walk to a game, it too is dependent upon strength. But the question is, what kind? What kind of strength is our spiritual journey based upon? Individual or group strength? Ponder that for a little bit. Okay, that's enough time. If you came up with that, you're probably pretty accurate because... Our walk is individual. There isn't any doubt about it. Each person will give an account for themselves. We, we understand the scripture is very plain about us all uh, being responsible for our spiritual journey in this life. But by the same token, we also recognize we're a team. And what better passage uh, than what Cece read earlier, that uh, although we are many, we are one body. And so we eat and we drink as a team, as one body together. We're about to, uh, to journey into the sea of self-examination by looking uh, at various ways that we're supposed to be navigating our own spiritual person and developing greater individual strength. And, and we're going to spend quite a few weeks on individual uh, affirmations, uh, things that, that illustrate our own spiritual strength, important things for us to consider. But I thought, you know, before we do that, it's really important for us to remind ourselves that, that we, don't, we don't make this journey alone. So before we, we set out to, to sail and before we leave port, we need to be reminded that even though we're going to be talking about a number of things relative to our individual spiritual strength, that we, we still depend upon each other even in that development of that individual strength. And so I want us to think about this morning about the significance of our team strength. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. I just mentioned one. Another is because this Wednesday night, we're going to begin two new classes, a men's class and a ladies' class, both of which I can just safely tell you are designed from the standpoint of increasing our team strength. If you have found it uh, difficult to make Wednesday nights, if you've never thought Wednesday night Bible study was significant, I will guarantee you that this may be the opportunity for you to change your life. Not because great teachers, not because of great material, but because the desire within both of those environments is for us to focus on team. And there is no strength that can ever be gained like team strength. So if that's, uh, if that's something you're pondering, look at it again. Consider it again because I think both, both of those opportunities are going to be absolutely tremendous. So that's one of the reasons we're talking about the importance of team today also. Okay, I want to begin. We're going to make three points about, uh, about team Christian. Number one is the power, the power of team Christian. At times, strength is totally contingent upon plurality. You know, Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 invites us to come and to take on his yoke. You know what he's saying? Come and be a part of my team. Be on team Jesus. Why did Jesus invite us to be yoked to him? 
Why not just say, and he does say, come learn from me, but why not just say, come sit in my classroom? Why does he say, be yoked with me? Because there's strength and plurality. If I yoke myself to the Son of God, and I am there to learn from him, then what happens to me is my individual strength is directly in proportion to my team connection. So Jesus invites us to come and to be yoked to him. How about this passage, a familiar story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. I want you to notice how there was team strength that was enjoyed and utilized in that response. First of all, their response is, we don't even have to answer you. You know, King, the pressure you're putting on us to bow down, we, we don't even need to answer it. It's foolishness for us even to address it. And then they say, the God that we serve, can't you just feel these three guys just leaning and gaining from each other? The God that we serve, can deliver us from this. He will be able to deliver us. Then, I love this, but even if he doesn't, we, we are not going to do what you've asked us to do because we worship God. We strength, plurality strength, team Christian. No wonder the Hebrew writer will say, and this is from the New Living, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God has trusted God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to act into acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We have a team. It's a we. There's power in the we. Most of us uh, become entranced by campfires. Becky got so entranced a, a week or so ago when I was burning all those fallen limbs in our little fire pit that uh, notice, notice how short her eyelashes are on one side. <laughs> but what happens? What happens to that beautiful fire when one of those burning pieces of fuel leaves the fire? It doesn't take long before it's, it's gone out. You know, first it'll lose its flame, and then that glow will disappear, and then the smoke will start, start, and then the smoke will stop, and then it'll be cold. Team Christian, it's so important for us to maintain our connection. Ecclesiastes, Solomon puts it this way, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Power of team Christian. Secondly, let's talk about the practices. The practices of team Christian. Team Christian is called to engage in numerous practices. However, when we go all the way back to the beginning, we find that it's, it's relatively a focused practice for Team Christian. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And th that was where Team Christian had its practice beginning. These are the things that we elevate. We want, we want to understand, we want to comprehend what the apostles are teaching. We want to connect with each other with this fellowship. We want there to be a, a commonality of breaking of bread and of, of celebration, and we desire to be people of prayer. Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 encourages Christians to walk in a manner worthy of their calling. And I think, obviously, when you and I think about the worthiness of our walk, going back to the principles, to the practices... The initial focus is a good place to reference and a good beginning place. So 
it is good for us to be people who are considerers. We are constantly driven to consider what the apostles taught, what the Lord desires, what instruction God has given, that we develop a comradeship between each other, that we, be, we truly maintain that kind of koinonia connection, that we be people who are involved in celebration, that we celebrate what the Lord has done for us, that we celebrate together, and also that we become communicators, talking, communing with God in prayer. Those practices are foundational. And abundant other scriptures, and abundant other scriptures outline numerous other practices that are part of team Christian, things that we need to be concerned about, things that we need to be engaged in. However, I want to suggest that Ephesians 4 kind of offers for us, if you will, the umbrella that covers all the other practices that you and I can find in Scripture. In other words, this overarching practice. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Come on. There. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. Overarching umbrella. Look at some of what Paul says. These are the... These are the foundational practices of Team Christian. Number one, I need to focus on my worthy walk. Remember, we talked about the fact that there is individual strength and there's collective strength. There is Team Christian and there is individual Christian. When it comes to me being a part of Team Christian, who's the person I should be most concerned about in the team? You know, it's always destructive in any team when somebody else becomes the focus of your attention. Let the quarterback begin to think that the guy who was supposed to catch the ball was having a problem and didn't do it right, and what happens to the quarterback? He loses his focus. Team, team Christian, I need to practice, first of all, making sure my walk is worthy. That's the beginning place. Paul will also say that we need to do this humbly. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about being led by the Spirit and the one testable, knowable truth that I can obtain and evaluate to comprehend whether I'm allowing the Spirit to lead me, and that was if I'm becoming less, if I'm lowering myself, if I am walking in greater humility then the Spirit is able to lead me. Paul says that we need to humble ourselves. When it comes to team Christian and the practices of team Christian, I need to be about lowering myself. I am about looking at myself. I am about lowering myself. Guess what I do to other team members? I treat them with gentleness. I elevate them. Numerous times in Scripture it will say, that we should not only look out for our own interests, but for the interests of others. I elevate the other members of my team. It becomes more significant to me that they become higher in thought, in my thought. That's gentleness. That I release my expectations. Isn't that a good definition of patience? I just smiled when I, when I wrote that one. Patience is really the release of expectations. You know, expectations get us in such deep trouble. All relationships, all team sports, expectations are troublesome. What's the biblical solution? Patience. That's what Paul says. That we also extend what is undeserved. And that perhaps is a good biblical definition of what tolerance is. You know, tolerance isn't putting up with everything. Tolerance is not swallowing all sinful practice and and becoming agreeable to all of those things. Tolerance truly is is the ability to extend something undeserved to another person on the team. Again, think about all of the times when in huddles, effective teams are trying to encourage the guy that just dropped the ball, trying to encourage the, the guy that just blew the dunk, and they take time out, and what's, you know, encouraging each other tolerating, extending that which was undeserved. 
We also find that Paul talks about conforming to the divine nature that we share with deity. That's what love is. Agape love is only something we can practice from our shared nature with deity. And so Paul says we also, in team Christian, develop this kind of love. And then we follow God's priorities, which amount, amount to preserving unity and that bond of peace, which God has created. And notice that it doesn't say that we've created that. God's done that, and, and our, our job as a team is to maintain and to follow those priorities that have been established by God. Living under such team practices is no easy task. Nobody, nobody said it was going to be easy. The Bible never says that it's an easy task. It is, however, something that must happen. Church people are going to disappoint you. They will fail you. If you have not lived long enough yet to be disappointed and failed by church folks, well, Cole's the only one that qualifies. Because we all know what that is. Now, how are we going to deal with that? We are still team Christian. And we have to harness ourselves to practice some things. Have you read this poem before? The Perfect Church? I think that I shall never see a church that's all it ought to be. A church that has no empty pews, whose elders never have the blues. A church whose deacons always deek, and none is proud, but all are meek. Where gossips never peddle lies or make complaints or criticize. Where all are always sweet and kind, and all to others, failures are blind. Faults are blind. Such perfect churches there, there may be, but none of them are known to me. But still we'll work and pray and plan to make our church the best we can. No perfect church. No perfect church. You know what? If I ever found a perfect church, I couldn't preach there. Because I'd contaminate it. Amen? You were, yeah, that, was a little, that was a little quick. That was a little harsh. I anticipated it would be. So, and if I could preach there, you'd never hear me preach. <laughs> okay. We get the point, don't we? There is nobody perfect in the team. No one on the team is perfect. No team is perfect. I'm so glad that God's church doesn't have to be perfect. He has not asked us to be perfect. He has asked us to follow Jesus. When you open your Bible and you turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, if you know the content of that book, you are amazed at the way that book begins because had most of us written it, it would not have started this way. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ and saints by calling. Most of us would have written, to the church that is full-blown servant Satan, who at one time was sanctified by Christ, but you've stepped away and you've started practicing all this other stuff. You're no longer worthy. Saints, hardly. Demons, maybe. That's how we would have started that book. Because when you look at the divisions and the lawsuits and the immorality and the practices that were present in that church, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. When it comes to Team Christian, our ability to actuate Paul's team practices is the only means of securing our peace amid a place of imperfection. Now, here, here is the vital point. We all agree we're going to disappoint each other. We all agree we're not perfect. So how can I find peace amid that kind of imperfection? If I'm striving to develop my individual spiritual strength and I'm a part of a group that I realize there is imperfections and there's not perfect group strength, how am I going to be able to, to balance that all? How am I going to be able to be a part of a team where imperfections exist? 
See what we just talked about? This is, the, this is the only way you will ever have peace, ever have spiritual peace in an imperfect church team. This is the only way. There is no other way. I focus on me before I focus on you. I elevate you. I lower myself. I treat you with gentleness. I extenuate tolerance. My expectations are lowered. I love you with the love of God. I am more concerned above all else to preserve the unity and the peace that God's created than anything. That's the only way I have peace with imperfect environment. And it's the only way you're going to have it. Because if you search for it any other way, it's not going to be there. If you search for it, oh, if, if such and such, if this would happen, if such and such would happen, I would, I would, I would be at, at peace with the team. No. It doesn't happen that way. Practices of the team. Let me encourage you to put your perspectives on trial. Accurate perspectives are always tied to objective truthfulness. When we're, when we're trying to figure out our team, figure out how accurate our perspectives are. I love this passage, uh, Zophar. You know, so much of Job is, uh, is written and it, it doesn't have necessarily true perspective. It's what these guys are telling Job and some of it's right, some of it's not. But Zophar comes to Job and he says, Oh, how I wish that God would speak that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom, for true wisdom has two sides. Know this, God has even forgotten some of your sin. New American Standard says sound wisdom has two sides. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. That's a verse that needs to be marked in every person's Bible because there's nothing truer that's ever been written in the book of Job than that. Sound wisdom has two sides. When it comes to me being a team player, when it comes to me functioning in an imperfect team, I need to understand sound wisdom has two sides. My perspective is only how many? One. It's only one. Sound wisdom has two. Sound wisdom. Powerful passage. Avoid turning unsupported perspectives into full-blown judgments. Boy, that's, that's easy for us to do. We take our perspectives one-sided with, with just one side of wisdom, and we turn him into a judgment. Samuel uh, records, Now my father, see, indeed see the edge of your robe is, is in my hand, that I have cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you. Know, that, know and perceive that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands, and I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. David tells King Saul. He waves a corner of his robe and says, Look, if I'm after you, I could have killed you, but I didn't. So I want you to perceive differently. I want you to process differently. But Saul was stuck in a judgment that said, David, I'm going to take you out. I'm after you. you, you you're going down. Saul, sound wisdom has two sides. You need to look at this other side. And then lastly, focus on and seek out those team members from whom you gain encouragement and strength. You know, if we're talking about team strength, find and, and, and depend upon those that give you that kind of input. I love what Paul says to the, uh, to the church at Philippi. Obviously, he has a very close connection to them. And he, he talks about how that in his preaching of the gospel that there was no one, no one who supported him in this matter of preaching the gospel like that church at Philippi. Who do you think Paul was tempted to, to think about and process and have in his heart when he was undergoing that list, that litany of, of persecutions that he gives? Who, what do you think was in his head? I'll tell you what was in his head. Those good people at Philippi. Those people that support me. Those people that are behind me. That's what was in his head. Why? Because he knew he was a part of a team. And he relied on that. Okay, last point. I want to talk about the players on Team Christian, the players. <clears throat> I hope nobody knows this guy because it'll embarrass him if it gets back to him. <laughs> uh, Terry Cricks is a preacher friend of mine in uh, Montana, and that is a record uh, 
412 green measurement, 68 elk that he shot a few years ago. We always give him a hard time that the thing was so old, anybody could have killed it, but. <laughs> Terry's dad ministered in uh, Libby, Montana. Terry uh, was not uh, in ministry, but his dad had a, a sudden heart attack on a snowmobile trip and passed away, and Terry began to preach. Talking about mid-70s, not exactly sure. I tried to call him and couldn't get a hold of him. It's just as well because it would have been a big ball fest. But um, Terry's been, that was mid-70s, so he's been in Libby, Montana for at least 35 years. That, that's, that's, there, there's some people who have been around for a long time in Montana, but Terry's been there in one place longer than anybody else. Uh, he, he is such a, a unique character. Uh, his, his spiritual drive is best illustrated by his involvement in search and rescue. He, he goes all over the United States when called upon with uh, dogs that he has purchased and he has trained. He is now, I think, on his third animal as a search and rescue. Uh, he, he repels out of helicopters with a harness that holds his dog to go search for people that are lost. And that's what he does spiritually as well. Ter Terry's just driven um, for at least, and that, that's, a, that's a terrible guess, for at least 25 years, Terry has directed teen camp at Yellowstone Bible Camp. A few years back, well, it's probably been 20 years back now, Terry decided that what would really help the atmosphere at Bible Camp would be to take the, some of the young men who were basically in leadership roles prior to camp and do this canoe trip down the upper Missouri River. So handpicked from various congregations, uh, two or three boys from uh, each place are invited, and you go, it's a 75-mile 75, 75 canoe trip. And um, very spiritual focus so that these young men are primed. So when they hit camp, they are ready to, to go. A few years back, We read about Paul saying that he, he wrestled the beast in Ephesus. A few years back, Terry wrestled some terrible beasts in Libby. Um, and because of his tender heart, he, he, he suffered and endured unbelievable things. And as he was working through those, living with the hope, that that pain's going to end. He developed a phrase, and for year, literally years, I'm going, to, I'm going to wager that if we asked Terry to come and preach for us, this phrase would be there somewhere. Because Terry's, Terry's hope now is in the phrase, team player. And he will not address basically a group of Christians without talking about being a team player. He will address people that are upset and ask them, are you a team player? He will address people that are on cloud nine with excitement. Are you a team player? He will address young people at Bible camp who are disgruntled about back home. And he'll say, are you a team player? Why? Because Terry knows what it's like when people aren't willing to be a team player. Brothers and sisters, we are a team. God's made us that. We have practices that as a team we need to engage in. But the ultimate question for every one of us is, am I a team player? Amen? That's the ultimate question. Am I a team player?
Good question for us to consider. Are you a team player? There's not a single team sport. Uh, there is not a single team sport that can have any level of success if team members are not team players. Team players. Can you imagine? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big Husker, uh, you know, athlete. But, you know, I'm only going to play when I, when I have got nothing else to do. You know, that's, that's when I'm going to play. Can you, can you imagine Bo Pelini putting up with somebody on the football team? Saying, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll give you 100% coach, but I got to have, it's, it's got to be on my timetable when I'm ready. Yeah, it wouldn't work. Wouldn't work. Because you're a team player. You're a team player. What's missing here? Yeah, this is so old, I saw church bulletin boards when I was a kid. What's missing? You are. You are. Team player. Am I a team player? The whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. New Living says, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Team player. As a team player, you are a part of the team. The text doesn't say every part that can do something. The text says every joint. Every joint supplies what it can. Everyone on the team is supposed to be a team player. The text says that we engage in the proper working, the proper working of what we're able to bring, and that that causes the growth of the body. When all bring what they have into the team as a team player, growth is the result when everyone is a team player, the body is being built up in love. That's how Paul outlines it there. You've heard of uh, the word synergy. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic word. I think actually it came into being around the 1600s. But uh, it, it has to do with how when two are joined, there is, there is a synergetic strength that is gained. The, 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 the strength of both individuals joined together, uh, the sum of that joined strength is greater than each of their individual strengths just added. They, they gain more. And again, when you, when you consider that Jesus said, be yoked with me, you and I, you and I synergetically are, are connected with Jesus Christ. What does that do for our individual strength? But we're also to be team players with each other so that what I bring to the table, what you bring to the table, what, what each member, team player, brings to the team makes the team more than all of the single totals of our strength. The word, however, that Paul uses when, and by the way, this is, is synergism grows from that Greek word, synergia. But that's not the word Paul uses when he talks about what every joint supplies. Actually, probably even a better translation of it would be ligament. Because the word which he, which he uses describes that which connects. So we are each to bring to the body that which connects to other parts of the body. We are the ligament. We bring our ligament because the, the, the movement of the body in a growth fashion is only going to happen when all of the ligaments are performing their individual parts. Colleen, last Friday, learned that when things aren't connected right, when the ligaments aren't working right, you've got to intervene. Because there has to be give and stretch and there, there has to be contraction in order for ligaments to work properly. So 
Paul says, are you a team player? Are you bringing to the team what you have? Because the team is dependent upon it. The team needs you to connect. Imagine what the spiritual body looks like when I don't connect, when I don't bring that connection. Paul says, when we connect, body is built up in love. Team player. Team player. As a team player, you are to fasten yourself to the body so that you add your synergy to the body's growth. As a team player, you are to become attached so that your ligament can do the expanding and the contracting that's needed to help the body move. So as we end, are you living in the power of Team Christian? As we talk about individual growth, that individual growth oftentimes is limited if I'm not connecting with the team strength as well. Are you conforming to the practices of Team Christian? And are you a team player? Are you living with those kinds of devotions? Yes, yeah, we talk about walking like Jesus, being like Jesus.